warm welcome to all of you, wherever you are in the world. Absolutely delighted to see you all here for our first Action for Happiness live event of the year. Over 5,000 people joining this live as we speak. So very grateful for you all being here, but particularly grateful to have Ruby Wax with us. Ruby, lovely to see you. Hi, hi. Thank you so much for making time for this. I can't wait to have this conversation and I can already see lots of excited uh, people on the chat, really keen to hear from you and indeed already expressing their gratitude to you for all the things you've been doing uh, in this space. How, how are you doing in these crazy times, Ruby? I don't know how to answer that because fine means I'm lying. And if I say anything else, it sounds like I'm whining. So <laughs> we have to have, find a whole new vocabulary. The word fine has to go first. That's yeah. gotta be thrown over a cliff. I, I'd like, I think we should do that is create new, a new language to cover this one. Don't you? Yeah, I, I agree. And I feel this sort of weird tension between feeling at one level really quite dark about the state of the world and also feeling quite grateful for some of the little basics, things that I feel that I'm lucky to have at a time when so many are struggling. And it's this real tension of, I don't know what the right word for that feeling is actually. Kissing the earth because you're breathing is I yeah. think. Well, here we are. And um, the theme of tonight's event is beyond frazzled. And of course, frazzled is a word that you've really pioneered with your amazing frazzled cafes and many other things which we will talk about. But I thought it might be nice. I mean, I'm sure many people joining this call are very aware of all the great work you've done. But I sort of wanted to start by winding back to the beginning, or at least when many of us first came across you with your amazing career as a, as a TV presenter and, you know, a huge amount that you did in the world of entertainment, which, you know, from reading about your life and from learning about you and hearing you speak sort of came to some extent crashing down from your perspective around how that left you feeling and 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 indeed where that took you on your own mental health journey i'd love to maybe revisit that a little bit and perhaps if you could share a bit about how that was and where it left you you want me to have another trauma <laughs> not not specifically but no. to perhaps recap a little bit well i was born in evanston illinois i was just, <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I came to the uk primarily i've said this before to get away from my parents who struggled so many years to get out of Europe. I struggled many years to get out of America back to Europe. You know, if you're a refugee, you're a refugee. That's the way it is. So um, I wanted to get away from them. So I came to the UK with no money and lived in a bed sit for about two years where it was not the pretty days of England. It was when everything was black and white. And if you wanted to take a shower, you had to kind of milk yourself with a piece of rubber hose. It wasn't a great, a lot of Americans came with me and they couldn't hack it, but I stayed. And, uh, and then I jump cut, jump cut, jump cut. I finally got into drama school in Glasgow because they really would, nobody wanted to be in Glasgow. Those, they didn't even have electricity there. Now, it's, of course, it's really cool. And then after that, I worked so hard so I'd never have to be a waitress again in Evanston, Illinois, which is where I was heading. So I got myself into the Royal Shakespeare Company with no talent, but a lot of push. Um, they used to, people used to, on stage, they would go, I can't believe I'm on stage with you because I was so appalling and I had an American accent. <laughs> I made myself popular and I wrote shows for myself. So, um, and then made Alan Rickman direct them. So that's how it started. And he said, you know, you should write the way you speak. And he trained me how to do comedy pretty much for the next 30 years. He said, really, you have to get off this stage because you're really a bad actress. A lot of people made that clear while I was on stage. The very famous actors would uh, leave me little notes saying maybe I should consider a comedy. So uh, anyway, I left the RSC, I got a job, and ended up with uh, Dawn and Jennifer and Tracy Ullman doing that. And then uh, gradually I crawled my way into television, got my own show, that's a long story. And then at a certain point, um, you know, you're consumed with your own narcissism. You know, you, I can see the disease really clearly as you start looking around to see who's looking at you. And if they are looking at you, you get really pissed off. It's the weirdest thing, but you know, it's an addiction. You get to call a restaurant and use your name and the door swing open. I mean, and eventually you think you're really that interesting, which you aren't. And um, at first I was just bringing in famous people to interview them. By the way, before I did Famous People, I had Louis Theroux's job where I did really great documentaries and met the most extraordinary people. I, you know, they made me a wizard in the Ku Klux Klan, which was the first for a Jew. And um, <laughs> I went to snake uh, worshiping ceremonies in Alabama where to show God how much they loved, he loved him, they threw cobras at each other. 
And if God didn't love them, sometimes they were bitten. So a lot of them were either dead <laughs> or missing fingers. It was to prove their love for God. So I got to see remarkable things. And I went to Russia during Glasnost and then they made me do celebrities. They didn't make me, they said, would you do celebrities this year? And I said, please let me get back to the Ku Klux Klan. And they said, uh-uh, we want you to do celebrities again. I'm not complaining, I know it's a great gig. It's just that, um, you know, eventually everybody, um, it's not as interesting as seeing the dark side of America, which has been my favorite topic for 25 years. And then eventually I was in, I was about 50. And that's when as a woman, you, you've got to sink into the sun, sunset, you've got to go. And you know, as you think, well, I look exactly the same, but clearly a bell goes off or something. And, um, and if you're really desperate, you start to claw your way back and show up on islands where you have to eat your young, or they do documentaries about your gallbladder operation. But I had a nervous breakdown. <laughs> because I'd lost my mind. I mean, Donald Trump was one of my last interviews and I thought, I can't hack this. I really can't hack it. It, it looks funny now. You know, he threw me off his plane at about 33,000 feet. That's a whole nice <laughs> Because he said, the first thing he said was he wanted to be the next president of the United States when we started interviewing him. And I laughed. I thought he was making a joke. So he said, that's it. I want her out of here. And he landed the plane. He didn't. His pilot did and they threw my camera crew and myself off in Arkansas and uh, left us there. So the whole show was looking looking for, I won't go into it. You can Google it. Uh, I, I have seen it and I'm, I'm you know, it's, it seems particularly prescient what you're saying about the, the drama of American life and the, the role of Trump given current circumstances, but let's not go down that path. But interesting hearing you mention Louis, I heard you on his podcast recently and, and you sort of shared really openly that that there was a sort of sense of trauma for you, both about how people like him came in and became the next generation of people doing things like that, but almost like that you, well, I, I know that you then went on to the next step, which was obviously talking really openly about your own mental health issues. How much of that do you think was there within you anyway, as opposed to perhaps triggered by that rather toxic environment you'd been working in? Well, I, you know, when my mother was young, they didn't know what mental illness was at all. So I had uh, 30 wonderful years with a woman who really had to be scraped off the ceiling and nobody mentioned that this might be mental illness. You know, had it been discussed, I'd understand, but to, you know, for a kid to not have a clue, I assumed everybody's parents were like that. So she really wasn't, you know, so when I had first had mental illness, people thought it was a physical illness and I was always giving blood away, you know, to see what I had and they couldn't name it. So of course you, um, I, you think you've lost your mind. Uh, I never told anybody I had mental illness and I didn't even know it until my third child. And then a doctor said, you, you know what you've got, you're clinically depressed. And it was such a relief because once you can name it, well, you know, it's mindfulness when you name it, it's not as if you're possessed by the devil, though that's how they treated people with mental illness. Mm. A couple of decades back, you would be burned at the stake. So things are looking up. Um, and I didn't want anybody to know but then once uh, Louis didn't send me to a, um, an institution, but a lot of things had accumulated at that point. And I guess it hit a trigger. I had depression all my life, but I didn't know what it was called. And then I had the kind of tsunami of depressions about 12 years ago and ended up in an institution. And I had to reinvent because I'd lost my career. You know, it was starting to show in my eyes, but people didn't, you know, I didn't even know what it was where you start to have temper, you know, you, you flare up in anger, the eyes would go dead, it would be impossible to move. I mean, before that, I could sometimes say I had the flu and not be on television, but now it was, if you don't deal with it, it starts to accelerate and it starts to get deeper and longer. So the last time I had it about 13 years ago, I said, I've got to, I've got to learn how to deal with this because this is going to ruin my life. And I've lost my job and my kids need feeding. <sighs> So I had to reinvent pretty quickly. Yeah, but you did that in a way that was in the public domain, which is incredibly brave. And I, I mean, I, one thing I wanted to say on behalf of all of the audience tonight is I think you've been an absolute pioneer in talking really openly about mental illness in a way that has genuinely shifted the dialogue. I mean, if I look at the news today, okay, we're dealing with COVID right now. I've heard mental health mentioned four times in mainstream media, different contexts today. That wasn't happening five, 10 years ago. You've been part of this revolution, I think, of making this 
part of our daily conversation and, and all credit to you but um did, that must have been a quite a strange experience sort of building like live shows where you would start to open up about this i remember going to one of the early ones and being blown away both by what you shared but also the kind of the feeling it created in the audience how was that well, I almost didn't have a choice. It wasn't like a brave thing I was going to do. I had no job at the BBC except, you know, doing shows of such um, humiliation. I mean, other people would think it's a wonderful thing to go. Well, you know the kind of shows. I, I can't even. My last gig, I think, was um, cutting the ribbon at Costa um, in Terminal 3. You know, you're, you're holding on to <laughs> yeah. open a coffee shop. It can get bad. It can get desperate. And I really wanted to move away before it, leave the party before it leaves you. So um, so uh, what happened was around the time when I was, I can't remember if I had the illness or it was after the illness, I had already started to go to learn how to be a psychotherapist because I thought, you know, heal thyself. That's what, what I first did. I, I wasn't gonna be a therapist, but I just wanted to meet people that were not obsessed with where their career is going up and down. And I had a whole new crowd. I mean, I still have my old friends, but you know, we talk about Jung and we talk about, you know, Carl Rogers and we talk about, and it was just thrilling to not hear that noise of narcissism. But I knew I wasn't gonna be a therapist. And around that time, I, I probably said this a thousand times because I did use this in my show, but it was true is that Comic Relief used a picture of me without asking my permission to raise money for one of their mental health charities. So they, it was a photo of me looking with a red nose, not my most attractive. And it said on it, one in four people have mental illness. <laughs> and then it said, one in five people have dandruff. I have both. And <laughs> I, I first knew about it when I was going down the tube station and thought, oh, there's somebody familiar. And gradually, it wasn't just one, it kept going all the way down the tube station where it was a picture of me. You can Google it, it exists. Yeah. And I thought, I'm screwed. I'm totally screwed up my breath. I, you know, I tried to throw myself in front of the first one, but they kept going and people going, that's you. You're the one who's mentally ill. So you sort of unintentionally became the poster girl for mental thought, health conversations. Yeah. Well, the only thing I thought to do, and I thought this was clever is I thought I'm I, now I have to write a show and I'm going to pretend that's my publicity poster. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. yeah. That's, that's the uh, brain of a refugee, like how to get out of Nazi Germany, same mentality. So, um, so not the same, but you know what I mean? You have to think on your feet because I was mm. so sick of getting busted for having mental illness because A, it's humiliating. B, I never told anybody and C, you know, the stigma was, it, well, I, it, since witch burning, I think this was the next step down. You would really be shunned by people, I felt, if you told anybody. So I wrote a show, right, and I did it uh, I did the show, but I didn't want to do it in public because then people would really know I was mentally ill. So I did it in mental institutions. So I did my first show, Losing It, for two years in different mental institutions. There were uh, some, a few private, but mostly national health. And the payment was, the remuneration was I could stay overnight because my happy place is being with my people. I, so they would let me stay over. I'd go in the smoking room after my show and meet you know, if you want to do theater, you need to look no further than the smoking room of any institution. And they, well, the gush of imagination and human vulnerability and, you know, no bullshit straight to the heart stories and being able to feel the compassion, you know, it's a hit on effect. You're only there for the next person. Something happens and it's, it's to me, you know, that's, I'm not saying that's why I do frazzle cafes, but when you get people who talk from the heart, Okay, there's, there's something really powerful yeah. about meaningful conversations and I, I felt it I came to when you when you did then take that show public I came to one and I felt that electric atmosphere in the audience but an observation I wanted to sort of ask you about Vivi was we met not too long after that in person and you very kindly came and did one of our action happiness events and I felt at the time in talking to you that you were being a, you know, a fantastically open uh, an entertaining character in the world of talking about, you know, mental health and really bringing it to life in an engaging way. But I felt that when we spoke personally, your narrative was, this is an issue, it's really bad, there's not much you can do about it, it's pretty effing awful actually. And then I feel that as I watched your journey, you, you, you seem to gain a sense of hope. And of course, later on, we're going to talk about this fantastic new book of yours, which is a very hopeful book. But I remember you saying that I think you've met someone who I often get confused with, Mark Williams, one of the leading mindfulness 
experts as part of your journey when you've been really ill. So how did mindfulness begin to find its way into this, this journey? You know, I was, I, I, part of mental illness is you can't really remember. I think if there's a God, he says, we're gonna erase your memory. You know, it's like it's it's like when women are you know having their periods. Same thing. You can't remember, and suddenly it comes that time of the month, and you want to hunt everybody down, and then you go, "Oh yeah, that's what it is." So in a way, you block out the horror of it. Uh, that's mm. that's um, maybe a blessing. So when I was um, still in the in the institution, Ed, my husband, used to pick me up and take me to. Um, mindfulness courses, right? That Michael Chaselton was running. Of course, you can't do mindfulness when you're that far gone because you have no mind, but I had an instinct that was something really interesting. And I remember people looking at me when I came in, I was still wearing my pajamas with an overcoat, trying to figure out, because I thought when I, I don't want to be this ill ever again. I know there's no cure, but there must be a way rather than spending the last bit of my money on shrinks, which I'd seen for 30 years and, and they're wonderful, but there's a point in your life where you, I thought I have to take over the wheel now. You know, there must be some exercise, something I can do so that I can regulate this machine. Not machine, but you know, at least I could spot it coming. The thing I couldn't stand about depression is you don't know it's there because I always say, you know, if your leg was broken, you can see that. But if your brain is sick, there's no other brain to see that something's wrong. So you're what's wrong with you. It's, I had to ask uh, somebody I was working with the first time I said, do I look crazy to you? And she said, yes. Mm. And I thought, oh, I better get to a place to help. So I left my house with a pajama bottom and a sock and ended up in a bedding office. The people that are the last to know are the ones who are suffering. And then gradually it dawned on me, but luckily I could pay for an institution, but Bupa runs out pretty quick. I could never go in again, you know, so. But I've, I did see a lot of national health mental homes when I was touring and there's, and there are sensational ones. I don't know if that's there anymore, but the point is, um, I don't know what, where the point was going. Well, I think I was kind of in, intrigued as to where mindfulness particularly started to become helpful in that really challenging situation you were in. Cause of course what you then moved on to doing was to start to, well, you went to Oxford University to study mindfulness and you brought it into well, your shows, but where, where did you first experience the benefits of it really? Well, when Ed would take me to see Michael, um, yeah. And I did that. Let me just say also what he did. This poor man was, I'm just going to go sideways a little bit. There was a show that they let me do. It wasn't a TV show anymore. They, they were letting me do something called, I think, Ruby's Room. It was online and it was, um, it, it, it was where somebody with a different pathology, let's say a schizophrenic, somebody with body dysmorphia, bipolar, would come to my house, read for real. Every week they'd knock on my front door, they'd come in. You'd see my cat, you'd see my kids, I'd give them tea, we would, and they, I would have an interview with them. And these are my people. So, I mean, there's, there's people I'm still friends with to this day, stunning. And then it would come up at the end, what the symptoms were of let's say schizophrenia, and then what, where to go. Now this should have been a TV show, but I was already replaced and gone, you know, like a kind of paper cup that's thrown away. So at least I was holding on and I did love doing that kind of show. They let me do it online called Headroom. It was Ruby's room. So my first guest was uh, somebody with depression and I'm in an institution. So Ed has to go get me rather than say, I have mental illness. He goes to get me. I put on shaking some lips, right? Everybody in the institution goes, this is so brave, which is no mean review from other people who are. <laughs> I go home, I'm slightly shaking. I'm sitting in front of a person in my house with depression. I have sweat running down me. My lips have that dryness that you get when you're really ill. And the camera crew don't know that I'm sicker than the person who I'm interviewing. And you can see them looking at me thinking, wait a minute, you're in way more trouble than I am. <laughs> mm. But I didn't want to lose my job. So then when it was over, I went, thanks very much, pretending I was somebody called Ruby because your personality is gone. And Ed put me back in the car and took me back to the... Um, the wow. I mean, thank you, as always, for sharing this, because it's really powerful to see how much this sort of is... I mean, you know, you've dealt with so much in such a lot of different... in such a public way. But then, in yeah. fact, I, what I've seen you do is bring some vitally important topics into the mainstream to really help people. So. You obviously uh, had decided you wanted to pursue a bit of an understanding, as I as I see it, of how the brain works, and you 
got into Oxford University to study a master's in mindfulness. Fantastic. And then and I, I think it's quite insane that you then built that into your show as part of the dissertation for your master's. Is that right? Yeah, what well, Willows is saying, when he didn't drive me home to interview schizophrenics or uh, depressives, he would also drive me to do mindfulness courses. By the eighth week, I think I was starting to wake up, you know, to come out of the, um, I don't know, it, the ether and back into a mind. And I thought, wait a minute, this is really interesting. So I asked Michael, who created this? And he said, Mark Williams. So I said, well, where is he? Because I am a driven person, which is great for career, but really bad for mental health too much of a turbo it'll well that's another story so I, I hunted down Mark I found him in Oxford I don't remember because I was still ill but Mark I think um said I'll teach you mindfulness I mean he's such a and I think he I I, I was home and I couldn't come out of my closet because I was so um terrified I think I may have the, Mark came into the closet and did a class with me and at the end, I said, I've got to learn what goes on in the brain. Mark, how can I find that out? And he said, oh, you'd have to get your master's at Oxford. And then he didn't hear from me again until I gathered every piece of evidence that I had been in, a, in school and here were my grades. And then, um, and then I did an interview like I've never done an interview before. <laughs> and then Mark called me while I was doing one of my shows and said, you got into Oxford. And that, yeah, there was nice. moments of bliss. And I, and, I, and I was at your one of your shows when you had was, I guess, were towards the end of that Masters and you were actually sharing with the public in a, in a really engaging, funny way, but actually secretly getting them to meditate. How, I mean, that must have been quite a, a shift for you in the style of your shows where you became more of a sort of almost like a, a well-being teacher, albeit through your own unique style. How, 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 what was the response to that like? Well, by then I thought I really can't, sh I can't shallow out anymore. You know, if you if you go deep enough, the thing is with mindfulness, you can't get back. You know, you can't go back. You can't drift into into lightweightness anymore. That's what you sacrifice. So when I did my show for my masters, I, there wasn't a lot of comedy. I just explained how the brain worked, and then I, I did you know my practical where you teach mindfulness, and then there's an inquiry, and then I used some of that stuff and bumped it up and turned it into a show. But um, I, my, my policy was make people laugh. You know, I mean, I write for Ab Fab. I know how to turn a line, make them laugh for like 40 minutes. And then you can start bringing in, their mouths are open, then you can put anything in them. I think you have to deserve to be listened to, you know, mm -hmm. unless you're a cabbage in and then I'm just like this. But I'm not, you know, I'm, I wasn't an expert in mindfulness. I just had the degree, but I thought I'm going to shift people so that they get more and more curious as to what I'm talking about, you know, this brain working in neuroplasticity and how we can actually take over, you know, and become the driver, not the driven. I, and I wasn't talking about mindfulness. I would go off and talk about my mother. I would talk about the animal, you know, I, it was a stream of consciousness, but gradually you could feel the audience going, well, what are you talking about? Oh, and I would sort of say, well, do you want to know? And then you sort of hear them go, okay. So it almost looked like by accident. And I said, all right, well, I will. All right, so everybody sit down <laughs> and then come away from the chair. And I think that first show ended with a mindfulness. Um, would you like to give us a very brief minute of mindfulness now, Ruby? What is would that? I? Yeah, would you like to lead us in a quick minute I of mindfulness? It's... You've got six and a half thousand people dying to know how you do it. How, how do we do this? How, how do you do mindfulness? Yeah, give us, give us a moment of mindfulness right now. Why don't we do that? Well, do you want me to explain it or do enough people know what my I think is? enough people know. Maybe you could just give us a taste of it because we're all here in this kind of rather bizarre time and just uh, it's really nice to connect and make this community feel together. So however you might do it, if you were in an audience in one of your shows, how would you how would you get us to be mindful? Well, I, you know, I never just say everybody sit back and go on a gluten free cushion and then sort of smell yourself. You know, it can be done really badly. Mm. I see. And boy, and I know how to turn off an audience in about two seconds. You know, you say one slip up and they don't trust you. So I didn't come out with that, that tone that sounds like you're, you know, kind of sifting your voice through yogurt and um, <laughs> tinging and like looking at a raisin for a half an hour. Uh, what I did, I sort of was talking about how the mind works and talked about what it meant to be frazzled. I, I'm not trying to deflect, I'm just saying, to me, it's really important to understand this concept of frazzled, which is not stress, but it's about stress about stress. So that's that churning thought. 
that really is it's a new phenomena to go shit I shouldn't be stressed nobody else is stressed I'm an idiot not good enough and the whole show is really talking about where we get this information you know and why now are we burn you know uh, sabotaging our own minds with our own thinking it never happened before before you die of old age or bad teeth or whatever but now we're carrying the grenades you know and throwing them in and I always say this mind, it's like somebody put a Ferrari on our heads, but nobody gave us the keys. So basically, it's explaining that we are in a state of total frazzlement. That's the culture. Don't get mad at yourself. That just happens to be the weather condition. And I talk about cortisol and the fight and flight. But if you take your focus to one of your senses, which, you know, besides us, sound, taste, touch, smell, you activate a different part of the brain called the insula. I make it simple. It's a neuroscientist would sue me, but you can't have a gabbling, gabbling, gabbling brain and be sensing something at the same time. It's like a car. You can't be in two gears at once and drive it. So you're either gabbling or you're sensing. That doesn't, you're not going to stay sensing because we're humans that think. So the thoughts will come, you pull it back to the sense, thoughts will come, pull it. And that's sort of like doing a, a mental sit up. And each time you pull it back, Rather than getting a six pack, you're making this insula, which is the thing that uh, makes you sense or tunes you into your senses. It gets buffer and buffer like a muscle. And so that when the shit really hits the fan in your life, you have this kind of, it's like a, a throttle to go, okay, go below the thoughts. It's not easy to do, but you know, so the thoughts will still come. They don't stop. People think there's a light that goes on where there's emptiness. When you're dead, it's empty. The thoughts come, but you're not so hit in the face with them. So you train yourself to pull to a sense. And actually in the brain scans, which is where I loved going to Oxford, uh, is to see the results of you know, that strengthened insula and that deactivated amygdala. And that creates that sense of ease and calm and clarity and ability to throw focus where you want to throw focus. I can't do this, by the way. <laughs> but I'm getting better. You know, it's like, how, how many times do you have to do a sit up to get a six pack? But that's the idea. And I can't, to this day, hear it when a depression's coming. Doesn't mean it's not coming, but I can hear and then do things about it. And if my kids are um, telling me something in the past, I'd be on the phone. And now I kind of, I can kind of have an overview and I go, okay, I have a choice, listen to the phone or listen to my kids. And I can get it down. I'm much better than I was. Okay, I'm nowhere near, you know, ten, but I'm at one and a half. Yeah, but that clarity of how you've explained it is really helpful, and I think just the fact recognizing we all struggle with this. Nobody quietens the mind. That's not the point. It's just about changing your relationship to some of this the thoughts, unhelpful but thought it pattern. Work. Yeah, it takes work to be able to, you know, the thoughts come in and you don't take them personally. I mean, what a genius! But sadly, you just can't do it on a weekend workshop. But uh, so well, we're going we're to talk a bit later on about how you're now going to be teaching some mindfulness courses for the first time, which is a lovely next step in your amazing journey. But just to continue from where we were. So you had these amazing shows where you brought in mindfulness. And then I think I'm right in saying you had some experts in the audience to sort of help with. Oh, you want me to or you want to go back to the experts? Well, I just I, I kind of I kind of what, what I'm keen to make sure we cover is the amazing Frazzle Cafe, because I think what you've created oh. there is a way of getting people together where you've got a little bit of clinical support and you've got sort of a real open conversation. And I, I think that emerged from the live shows, but I'd love to hear a bit more about, I mean, okay. I know you and I before spoke a bit about the, the before we go to but, question and answer, yeah. Before we go to question and answer, I'll do the mindfulness. Okay, great. All right. Okay, let's do that, let's do that then. Um, um, so so just, about, just about when I was doing the shows, uh, in the second half, uh, I would, I'd, I'd let the audience talk. So after they'd done a mindfulness and they had drinks, after the interval, they'd come in and then we'd have inquiry basically. And people started to really come out and say, you know, I'm totally depressed. I don't... <laughs> and they'd get rounds of applause from people. And it became a kind of badge of honor to say, I am totally screwed. And sometimes it was funny and sometimes it was heartbreaking. And um, you know, this was as good as AA gets, which was always my dream but I'm not an alcoholic, is to have a space where you could just be you, you could be honest, and people would listen and not get bored and look for the next most interesting person. So when I was doing my show in London, I invited the big players in Mark Williams, Lewis Walport, 
Peter Fonagy, um, you know, I, the big boys and big women, you know, who are really top of the profession. And I'd invite the audience in, not an audience, I'd invite the public in for free during the day. And they'd come and listen to these guys talking. And then Sane, led by Marjorie Wallace, brought in therapists and uh, volunteers, and the audience could mingle with them. And, you know, they would explain what therapy is and the stigma, you could feel it just draining away. And it was free. And I thought, this is fantastic. I serve cookies. Um, and it was th the first day I was telling you before, um, the first day one, there was a girl in the audience and she said, I, I want to kill myself. And six women, I remember, ran at her and crowded around her. And she came back every single day and eventually started coming to the shows. And in one second, just she, she had a nest of humanity around her. And that became that I was doing a talk for Marks and Spencer's, as I do for a lot of companies. And I said, my dream is to have not a theater anymore, but maybe something like Starbucks, where groups of people could meet and they could speak human to human to each other instead of this cocktail crap we have to live with. Oh, how are your kids doing? Like I care. So I, I said, and so I'm going to ask Starbucks. And they said, no, no, we'll give you our cafes. So for four years, up and down the UK, we had uh, facilitators and then 12 people or 15 would meet regularly every two weeks, you know, more or less. Some of these groups stayed together three years. And now, starting in March, I've been running. I ran it every night I, and I'm going to run it again uh, starting January 20th, three times a week at 530. And then I have hosts during the day if you want to go to a Frazzle smaller meeting, you just go on frazzlecafe.org and you can go to a smaller meeting or mine, which is about sometimes 80 people. We begin and end with mindfulness and then, and then you watch what happens. It's not a free for all, it has a structure, but it'll break your heart how, when people are human and they care about each other, it doesn't matter what age, what color, what ethnicity, they're all looking at each other in their squares going, yeah, that's me, that's how I feel. And you, one girl who something terrible happened, first of all, we can't, it's not therapy. So we're not helping people with, who are in the midst of a mental health issue. We tell them where they can get help, but we're dealing with people who are frazzled, which is pretty much everybody. But one girl said something terrible happened to her. I don't know, this is just one. Imagine thousands I've heard. She said something really, horrific happened and every year when this event happened she's had to be put away because it's the anniversary of this and she's been doing sign language since it happened so when she came on she was sitting on her hands and she said this is the first time I've spoken and then she started to speak and, and she said in Tuesday's the night where I'm usually you know it's the anniversary of this and I begged her to come back on Tuesday and gradually, gradually, she started to speak and she put her hands down and you just see people looking at her with such love and she'd apologize for speaking. We go, keep going, but it's not therapy. It's just a kind of but listening. It, but it's a, it's, a, it's a really important space. And of course, as you know, we've had um, not quite the same, but we've got a lot of volunteer led community groups in the action happiness community. And there is something really special about that. People feeling in a safe space where they can talk about really meaningful things. And I, I've heard you talk about uh, your, kind of your love you have for this tribe of people that you feel like they're family now that you've connected with them in this way. And I think it's remarkable. That, I mean, you've done this and brought this online in the COVID world. We've had to do the same with our volunteers running things online. And I've been really moved to see how much this still works, even when you can't be in the same room. Have you found that as well? Ours works much better because it was so hard for people to get to Marks and Spencer's in Birmingham or whatever. And now that some people are in LA, some people are whatever. But community works really quickly when people are listening to each other and caring. And I never thought using technology that that oxytocin would pass, but because we can't be distracted because we're on the equipment, we're actually more tuned in than I've ever been in real life. It's mm. just, and one girl, one woman said, you know, I'm practicing for when I get out of here that I'm really learning to listen to how you see the world. It's, we have breakout rooms, so you meet in smaller groups. I, if, if I didn't have that, I don't know how I would have made it through the pandemic because I knew I had it every night. And likewise, so, I'm sure you've helped lots of people through the pandemic and that's fantastic. And I will make sure we include a link to Frazzle Cafes in the follow-up email to all participants tomorrow. So all the people who are asking on the chat about whether they'll be able to find out more, we'll send lots of more information. But I want to make sure we leave time to talk about your great new book, to take up your kind offer of a brief mindfulness and also to get to some of these great questions. So let me come to the new book, Ruby. So. 
Uh, and now for the good news. I, I must admit, when we first met, I wouldn't have imagined that you would have been writing a book about the good news. So where has this new hopeful Ruby emerged from and what, what's the kind of main message you're trying to get across with this great book? Well, first of all, I have to blame the monk. You know, I wrote How to Be Human with a Monk and a Neuroscientist and Tupton's been living in my house uh, since I met him, except now he has COVID. He's had it since March. Um, so he's had to move in. I haven't seen him for a year, but you know, he's the joy of my life. And uh, he kept, you know, he would always talk about compassion because not only writing the book, I toured doing shows with the monk and the neuroscientist. Well, that was the happiest time of my life. And Tupton would go on about compassion, which would make me wince in a corner. I just, and, and the neuroscientist, Ash, we would also get kind of like thinking there are these greeting cards with little, you know, doggies going, I woof you, you know, just cringe making. And I used to tell Mark Williams too, the, that compassion bit. I know it's in, implicit in it, but to discuss it. And gradually I realized when I got to writing, and now for the good news is yes, we are born in a compassionate state because that's how mothers grow our emotions for us. If we weren't connected and it wasn't through the heart, then we're psychopaths. So um, I got it. I said, maybe I'm wrong about the last book, you know, uh, that um, the reptilian state doesn't rule, but how do you claw your way back to this? feeling secure enough to open the heart because boy, you have to feel safe. Because we, you know, and I particularly found it interesting because my dad was a businessman and he said, you know, kind of kill before they kill you. You know, and the, uh, that American, he was an immigrant. So those were the real killers, you know, screw the guy before he, you know, and, um, and then finding out that survival of the fittest, which I assume meant the same thing my dad meant. That's not what Darwin, meant it all. He meant the, the, the survivor, the fittest, is the guy that cooperates the most. That's what he meant. You know, those are the ones that pass their genes, the guy who's the most liked. And it was um, Herbert Spencer and all some industrialists who changed it to sort of imply that, you know, it's the more aggressive male, the, you know, the alpha is the leader and the poor deserve to get nothing. So interesting. Now, suddenly I started to see, wait a minute, this is all a myth that we have to be these tough guys. And then as my, I did research for my book, I went around the globe looking for the, where the green shoots are in business. So I worked for Patagonia, the sportswear company where it's called conscious capitalism, it, Unilever, Ben and Jerry's, you know, they're doing business in a whole new way or they're trying and people roll their eyes and go, yeah, but, and I wanna go, you wanna yeah, but for the rest of your life or you wanna really know what's out there. And I went to schools that would break your heart because of how they're teaching kids emotional intelligence. I mean, and, and PS, if you're worried about your kids' grades, there's one called REACH 2, it's in the UK. They went from something like 17% below, you know, what the standard was. And now they're at 82% above what the Ofsted standard is. Because when kids' brains, and you know this, can think clearer and they're not so traumatized and they can read their emotions. So these kids, and you could see they come from, there's a school called Reach 2. There's about 60 of them. They're in, in, from traumatized homes. They're in, in the worst neighborhoods. And you could see that these kids might be tomorrow's criminals, but they're learning to say, um, uh, speak from the heart a little bit. So they have to do like the train of love in the morning to say what they appreciate about the next one. And then they learn to use a breathing ball when they start to realize they're going into the red zone. You know, they can read where their emotions are so they know to take a break. And you can see that these teachers are training them to lower their cortisol, right? And to understand that they are just as good as everybody else. So they're taught there is no such thing as a stupid question. And if your question is really unbelievable, but way off the chart, you get the A. And there's a Zen den that the parents built for these kids and the parents are pretty much uh, unemployed. And at the last day they all got together, 600 of them sang to me um, a song, it's called A Million Miles, which I can't stand, but I wept because these kids, their hearts are open. And I thought I'm gonna, I can't, and I don't cry because I'm on antidepressants, but it was really touching. So I, I think you're right. You're right to highlight this because the kind of impact of both mindfulness and emotional intelligence in 
at an early stage in life is so transformative. And I think it's brilliant that you're bringing that to life at a time when, of course, our young people are under a huge amount of sort of stress and pressure, much of which is perhaps unnecessary and, and unhelpful to their lifelong sort of learning. But I think you've also did some like changing the way you live. I th- am I right that you went and sort of embraced an intentional community up at Fintorn and yeah, tell it, me about the, that. Well, I, in business, I did Patagonia and blah, you know, and watch the kind of uh, the ethics now coming into companies, which they are not the greenwashing where they put, um, they give you a bonus if you don't flush the loo. I mean, some of these companies are really doing remarkable things. You know, they're trying. And uh, and there was another chap. There's a lot of chapters on te- who, the good guys in tech, the good guys in whatever, but in community, there's intentional communities coming up now. And one is in South London, where A, they're trying to lower the footprint, but B, they're learning to be living in community. And as I say, it doesn't have to be out in pet, you know, somewhere in the middle of nowhere, there are, they're called intentional communities. There's 10,000 of them now around the world. Some of them I've, I've in favelas and in you know, African villages and also in really sexy places in Ithaca, New York, where it's just, when, when it goes beautiful, it's beautiful. You know, they, there is zero emissions. The homes are spectacular. This is the one in New York. Um, people are professors at Cornell and startups, but they learn that, you know, they have each other's backs and they have to work for the community three hours. I wanted to go there, but then uh, the pandemic happened. So I moved to Findhorn where I'm now going to get a little house. Um, it's been going 58 years. It started off, it was so hippie, but now we're in a whole new ballpark. It turns out, you know, A, nobody asks the shallow question. Um, B, there's real concern for, okay, there are problems, but I worked on a in the vegetable garden where all the food goes to a food bank. And um, with these extraordinary, extraordinary people, they just cut the crap. You know, these, these well, the women, especially these great earth women, you know, that some of them were, you know, professionals, some of them were teachers, whatever. And they've come to just appreciate working on the land and living this kind of simpler life where there is a sense of community, you, you know, and they used to have dinners together. Now, of course, with COVID, they couldn't. And I started going swimming in the North Sea. I mean, please tell, in November, that wasn't thrilling, but you're just inspired by people living a different way. And I really want to be part of that. And I'm sick of people at dinner parties or whatever, yipping on about the environment. I've always said, either do something or shut up, get off the pot, just do something. So I think, okay, so I'm going to, get a little house there. It is zero emissions. So I don't have to discuss the problem anymore. I I fixed the problem myself. For me, I can't work for the rest of the world. And this is, I think, really touching on, you're touching on the sort of heart of the Action for Happiness mission, which is things change when we do something. They change for ourselves, but they also have an an impact on others around us as well. Um, Ruby, I take up your kind offer of maybe leading us in a mindful moment before we take some questions from this lovely audience. How would you like to do that? Okay, I'll do it. So what I was talking about before, which was watching that gabbling brain, which even though we've been talking, I have been getting some incoming things like, you're not making sense anymore, Ruby. I think Mark isn't listening. I don't think anybody's listening to you and you're gabbling. You know, I'm always getting the worst reviews known to man. So the mind is gambling, but if we take our focus to a sense, we start to be able to lean back and watch the thoughts. So I'm just telling you what's going on in my mind. So let's, if you're sitting in a chair, maybe just um, so your spine self-supporting, neck relaxed, so your head's just balanced on the top, not rigid, shoulders down. Of course, you can do mindfulness walking, driving, eating, whatever, but we happen to be on Zoom. So that would become impractical. So bum on the chair, feet on the ground and eyes open or shut, that's up to you, whatever you wanna do. But so we're gonna take our focus to a sense. So we'll just start with just bringing as much attention as you can to where both feet are making contact with the ground, if you can. So really feeling the weight of both feet, the footprints they make on the ground from the toes to the back, to the heels, side to side. Just that thin layer of skin that is between you and the ground, the floor. 
Okay, then just let that image go. And now again, take that focus and bring it to where you might be sensing your body touching the, the chair or the sofa. So you just feel your weight. the outline of your body and the weight in between. And then just letting that go, just let it drift away. And now just take that beam of focus, that attention to sound. So all you're doing is listening. To the right, left, behind, above. Just listening. And then you'll notice, and it, this has to happen. If it doesn't, something's not right. You'll notice that you're thinking about what you're listening to, or your mind's drifting off, or you've just drawn a blank. You like the sound, you don't, you don't know what's going on. Wherever your mind went, it's supposed to happen because humans think. So almost congratulate yourself. You noticed it. And now the difference with mindfulness is you noticed it. Take the focus. You haven't done anything wrong. Just bring it, bring it back to listening again. And then the thoughts will come. They have to. You might not hear the thoughts or notice them, but you know you're not listening anymore. So you've gone off piste. That's fine, you noticed. So bring it back and it'll happen a hundred times. That's the whole thing. Listening. And noticing. And then bringing it back to listening. And then just for the last bit, let, let the sound go. Just take your focus off of it. And the same way you were letting sound come to you, you don't have to look for it. Just take, take your focus to where you're breathing. You might be in your throat or your chest or your abdomen. Just go where, the, where it's most vivid for you. So, and then just stay with that area, just sensing the air going in and going out. Just really zoom in with all your attention to where actually you feel the air going in and out. Noticing when the thought comes in and just gently, just take your focus back to that breath. The more you think that's good, you've recognized it. Don't give yourself a hard time. You haven't done anything wrong, just breathe. And maybe we'll end with five breaths where you count each breath, but without forcing it, let it breathe you. So you go in, out, one. If you lose your way, you go back to one. There's no contest. So to five. One, in, out. Okay. Thank you, Vivi. Um, that was really great and very nice to reconnect with a bit of calm in an otherwise busy time. Um, and you're teaching uh, a mindfulness course for the first time. So I, I know we're going to send a, a link to that for anyone interested in the follow up email. That's, that's another progression in your journey to actually sharing this great skill you now have with more people. Yeah, well, do you want me to say when it is, or you want to? Um, well, we can send that in a follow-up, but if you want to say anything more about it briefly, I'd like to come to some of these questions as well. Well, I, it's February 8th. 
there's one hour per week of me teaching mindfulness, uh, which I was trained for, but I only did in a theater. So uh, it goes on, it's an hour and then it, the recordings are available and you can uh, join if you go to mindbodyspirit.co.uk and it's the first time I'll ever be teaching mindfulness, but that's what I was meant to do. Mark Williams will be very happy. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Um, and there's a lot of love and gratitude coming up on the chat uh, for what you've just done. And, and I'd just like to say, because I know some people have found the chat a bit distracting because there's been such a lot of comments. So thank you all for hanging in there and being mindful with all the distraction as well as what Ruby's saying. So Ruby, we've had loads of, loads of questions. We're not going to get through all of these. Ian has said he's really interested in your effort to help others, but when you're also struggling on your own journey. And he said he, he recognises other people's struggles and sometimes ends up too involved, which then overwhelms him. And he gets a bit disappointed. Is there any way, or any advice on how we can balance that? Sort of, you know, should he get himself to a certain level first before trying to support others? You know, it, all of this stuff is so subtle. There's no yes, you should, and here's the thing. It, you know, the thing about the mindfulness, it's such fine tuning. You know, it's almost like when you're listening to a heartbeat or something. You, it, it, all mindfulness really is is tuning up this instrument that says, what's the weather condition in my mind? Can I take this news or am I going overboard now and it's burning my brain? So the same with compassion, you gotta pick your fight. You know, that's, and then other, what, what were we, I was saying, or Tupton said, it's like you, you dive in to save somebody uh, who's drowning, but you can't swim. So you're both gonna go under, but it's not something somebody can say, oh, now you've done too much or you haven't done. This thing about mindfulness is really being a blue. Well, exactly what I said is impossible when you can't when you have mental illness is you can read your own mind and when you can read your own mind you know what I mean by that like you can go oh, whoa I'm off today but not beat yourself up for it because that's like saying don't smoke the cigarette you're going to smoke more but just to know my brain is tight today when you learn to manage it, you can start to um, know when it's appropriate to help somebody because if you're screwed and you're thinking you're helping somebody, you're carrying your, you know, we work like neural Wi-Fi. You're handing your neurosis to the next person you're not helping at all. You know, there's a moment where it's, but again, it's so subtle. You can't reach for that state where it's quite expansive, but we do feel it when you are doing mindfulness. It'll go, you know, for a second. And that's, you know, it's like these kids, they get ready for when they're at they're not at red, they're not at yellow, but they're at green, which isn't peaceful and blissful. It's just you're present and you can recognize it, then go help somebody. <laughs> mm, yeah, well said. Um, and sort of related to that question from Christine, which I think is particularly relevant in this current situation where many people are facing not just perhaps inner trauma, but very real external threats to themselves and their loved ones with this virus. Christine said, um, please can I ask Ruby if she has any advice on catastrophizing? I'd love to understand why my mind keeps having terrible thoughts about death, both mine and my loved ones, etc. Thank you. So, I mean, ha ha there are very re real reasons why we might be worried about our health and other, our loved ones and so on, but how can we help with that? You know, welcome to the universe. Um, part of what I was writing about and uh, why I love studying this stuff is it's not an accident that you catastrophize. It isn't, and we we had to, we have to think negatively, otherwise we wouldn't have survived. And I think Rick Hansen says that our minds are built to see to um, as Velcro for the uh, Velcro for the negative and Teflon for the positive, and that about out of five thoughts, four of them are usually negative, because back you know back in the past we had to be on our toes to decide what's a snake was what's a stick and if we made one mistake we were off the planet so we have a leaning toward always looking for the bad news now we are in a situation of bad news <laughs> so it's no wonder you know that but but I was catastrophizing way before the uh the thing where you know we're we're in a culture where you're never good enough somebody else is prettier somebody else is richer it's shoved in your face when we lived in a small tribe Big deal. One person was more attractive. Well, I could go get the wood, but we're in a we're in a scrambled time. We're in a scrambled culture. Um, your catastrophizing will not go away unless you're on very high medication. <laughs> but the thing about mindfulness is you learn to go. Oh yeah, okay, that's the catastrophizing record. It's CBT. It's cognitive therapy. You go. Yep, that's what I'm doing, and you don't believe it. 
you know, I mean, when this is over, Ruby would go, well, that was a disaster. Okay, it might have been for some people, but you know, it's training, training, training. Okay, but maybe it wasn't completely. So it's sort of seeing through the transparency of these thoughts. You wanna analyze why you have them. I can't do, I don't wanna waste any more of my life. You have them, I have them. There's black and white thinking. We're bigots, we're all natural born bigots, but the awareness is where the liberation is. So mm. don't beat yourself up. We are all like that. That's, it's a human it's, glitch. We're not perfect. It, it's part of the human condition. Condition. Now you mentioned what you said there, Ruby, as well. And um, you've talked very openly about how you've taken antidepressants for your own mental health challenges. Judy has asked a question. Have you ever tried to come off antidepressants? So I wondered if you might want to say a little bit about how you see medication in relation to things like mindfulness and other sort of ways we can respond to these challenges. Well, you know, as Mark Williams said, I, I, I have a disease. Um, you know, you always hear about people getting over their disease. Well, you know, good for you. I, I, I would rather not throw all these pills in me, but if it's like, if I had cancer, I'd do chemo. If I had diabetes, I'd be taking the insulin. So we should have as much respect for a mental illness. Uh, it's not our imagination, it's a sickness. It's not to be confused with being frazzled or anxious or whatever. You know, I mean, I think I've been trying to train people, mental illnesses. Some people think it's on the spectrum, I don't. I think either you're pregnant or you're not pregnant. You know, that depression has a look, the eyes are dead and teachers should start to notice that. They're not depressed, they're not sad, they're dead. You know, there's no question when somebody has Alzheimer's, you know, you wouldn't say to them, oh, pull out of it. Come on, you know where you parked your car. So have a little respect for this one too. So I need medication. Yeah, I wish I wasn't on it, but any disease, I, I deal with it that way. I'm not into the alternative. Uh, and, but but if, if, if medication worked, I wouldn't have to do mindfulness. But the thing about med medication is you have relapses. So it's not foolproof. But for 12 years, I've been able to, I haven't been in the institution, but, and that's not to say I, can, I can't, I feel it coming, but I do things quickly so that it doesn't take me off for five well, months. On, on the subject of what you might do yourself, Ruby, and one final question, because we're rapidly running out of time. Sarah has just written, I can't believe I've just done mindfulness with Ruby Wax. Ruby, do you have a favorite practice that you teach? So what's your favorite way of kind of bringing this into your own life on a day-to-day -day basis, Ruby? Um, that's different how I do it and how I teach it. Mm. I mean, how I do it is before I, when I used to do my shows, that I practice boy because I don't want to get on that stage and I'm swamped with, um, pa with panic because I know what happens. The, your saliva dries up, your heart starts beating and you can't remember one line. And that's too terrifying to even think about. So because I practice a mindfulness, when I get on stage and I find my, that, that slipping happening and what happens when you lose your lines, the audience get really angry. You can feel it's terror anger and they turn on you. So just because I practice, I can, I try to get the sense of my feet on the ground because any physical, any physical sensation does lower the cortisol. You can't be up here and breathing at the same time. That's not to say, you know, I said before, you don't stay down there, but as soon as I start to focus on my feet on the ground, I can feel the cortisol's going down because the audience starts smiling. Now they didn't know I just did mindfulness, but it's even if you do one or two minutes a day in a bus queue, or you know, when I walk down the street, rather than having to go to a gym, because who has time, I use my handbag and I do 10 of these, but rather than just doing it blindly, you focus on the sensation in your arm as you know, people look at you, whatever. Um, then you notice your mind takes you away. Then you bring it back to the sensation in your arm. So now you're getting a muscle and you're developing. I love that. Arm. You're doing the bicep curl and the mental workout all at the same time. That's fantastic. That is frazzled where you can combine yeah. physical. Um, that's how I teach it. So Mark Amazing. let me do that um, to, to make it more practical in how you, how you, you know, brain exercise can be done sitting in a bus. It can be done sitting in a loop. It can be when you're having coffee in the morning, you taste the coffee or the tea. You watch where your mind goes, Jesus, I have so many things. There's 8,000 things I haven't done today. Go back to the taste. It'll last two seconds. My, 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 go back to the taste. For 10 seconds, that insulin is already changing. So it's brilliant. Ruby, we're, we're out of time. And on behalf of everyone who's been here, we've had 
nearly 7,000 people join us live on this call, which is amazing. And I think it's probably the biggest audience we've had of one of these yet. No. So lots of people are really keen to hear from you and really grateful because you, as always, have been incredibly honest and open, inspiring. And I think what, what's lovely about this whole journey that you've been on is that you've now gone to a place where you're not just thinking about dealing with your own trauma and sharing skills, but actually in this new book, you're talking about how we can all connect more with each other, look for the good news, a ripple in the world around us as well as in our own Well, you life. know, to know people are really watching. Finally, you wanted to leave us with as a thought. I'm sorry, we lost each other for a second. Yeah. Now, I was just going to say, did you want to leave us with any final thoughts at the end of this conversation? Oh, God, that's tough. Well, that the book, you know, that I wrote, this one, <laughs> and now for the good news, there is good news growing out there, and I'm a cynic. But if you, um, you know, just to understand what people are trying to do now, and if we give them our attention rather than the news with yet another horror show, then these little seeds will grow us into a really great future. There are really interesting things happening in the world right now. We just have to notice it. And you read my book. Don't, don't, uh, you don't have to buy it. Just pick it up, read where they are, and then go home. <laughs> go home and look it up and change your life. <laughs>